Don't stand around with your hands in your pockets. When I was growing up, I heard those words so many times from my dad. So my dad, growing up, he was always putting my brother and he was always putting me to work, right? Has anyone else had like a, an experience like this with their dads? They're always put to work. Um, and, you know, he would have us doing all of these projects. We would be bucking hay bales. We would be digging gravel. We would be building a new dog house. We would be doing all these projects, painting the house, doing all these projects around the house. And he was always pulling me and my brother into it. And, you know, at the time, I really didn't appreciate it. <laughs> um, but, you know, now that I'm a little older, I recognize, like, how, how much my dad asking us and really pushing us, making us work um, it really helped me and helped my work ethic and helped me to become a better worker. But the one thing he was always saying to me was don't stand around with your hands in your pockets. Now, why would he say that? Why would he say that to me? Well, the number one reason is because I was standing around with my hands in my pockets when other people were working. But the rationale behind why he said that, or the rationale behind why he said those words to me, those words to my brother, is because when you're standing around with your hands in your pockets, it means you're not working. It means you're not doing the job that you're supposed to be doing. And even worse, standing around with your hands in your pockets, it could mean that you're not even willing to work. You don't even want to work. You ever met someone, you've worked with someone, and they've just got their hands standing around with their hands in their pockets, and they're like, well, why would I want to work? What's the point of that? What's in it for me? I'm not getting paid near enough for this. You ever worked with anybody like that? <laughs> I have. <laughs> so in God's kingdom, and yes, we had, to, we had to eventually get there. In God's kingdom, we are God's chosen workers. And that means we've got work to do. We can't be standing around with our hands in our pockets. Am I right? So today we're going to be looking at two Bible passages that explain what that work is and why we need to do it. So please turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 1 verse 3. Acts chapter 1, verse 3. So during the 40 days after he suffered and died, Jesus appeared to the apostles from time to time, and he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. And he talked to them about the kingdom of God. And then skip ahead to verse 6. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept on asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and to restore our kingdom? And he replied, The Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. In other words, it's none of your business. <laughs> but what is your business, verse 8, is that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, throughout Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That's it. That's our global mission. That's what we're called to do. That is what God has commissioned us, starting with the disciples, Moving on into us, thousands of year later, years later, that's what we have been commissioned to do. Then, after saying this, Jesus was taking, taken up into a cloud while they were watching. <laughs> Gone. And they could no longer see him. As they strained to see him, rising up into heaven, suddenly, two white-robed men stood among them, Angels just right there, right among them. Two white-robed men stood among them. And they said, and this is my absolute favorite part, I love this. They said, men of Galilee, why are you standing here staring into heaven? In other words, why are you standing around with your hands in your pockets? Get to work. You've got work to do. Why are you hanging around? 
right? They received their commission already. Why were they waiting around watching Jesus go back into the sky? There he goes. Please come back. You see, the disciples were looking to Jesus to bring the kingdom. The disciples were looking to Jesus to bring the kingdom. But Jesus was looking to them. Jesus was looking to them. And don't we do the same thing in our own lives? When we, when we say, okay, God, God's got work for it. When uh, there's work to be done, we say, okay, well, we pray, God, will you please accomplish this? Will you please do this? Will you please do this? But really, God's looking to us to accomplish his mission. God's looking to us to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. That's what we've been commissioned with. Yes, Jesus will come again in his own authority and in the Father's timing. But until that day, bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth, that is our responsibility. That's our responsibility. It's on you. It's on me. It's on all of us. Every single one of us. It's on us. To take the gospel to the ends of the earth, we just need to go out and do it. We just need to quit standing around with our hands in our pockets. I'm going to keep saying it. Keep, quit standing around with our hands in our pockets and go do the mission God has called us to do. Or support those who are doing it. There's a similar passage found in 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. And it says, Most importantly, I want to remind you that in the last days, how many of you feel like we're in the last days right now? I know I do. In the last days, scoffers will come, mocking the truth and following their own desires. Wow, this is so real. They will say, hey, whatever happened to that promise that Jesus is coming again? I mean, seriously, guys, it's been 2,000 years. He's not coming. He's not coming. From before the time of our ancestors, everything has remained the same since the world was first created. In other words, Christianity, God, has had zero impact on the world. It's all gone into just chaos. There's nothing, nothing has been gained. So why are you waiting around for Jesus to come back? And this is Peter's response. Verse 5, they deliberately forget They make a conscious decision to forget, to not see, that God made the heavens long ago by the word of his command, and he brought the earth out from the water and surrounded that earth with more water. Then he used that water to destroy the ancient world with a mighty flood. And by the same word, the power of his word, the present heavens and the present earth have been stored up for fire. They are being kept, held in position, kept from being burned up for the day of judgment when ungodly people will be destroyed. And this is the most important part. But you must not forget this one thing. My dear friends, a day is like a thousand years to the Lord and a thousand years is like a day The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as people think. He's not being slow. No, he is being patient. And why is he being patient? For your sake. Because of you. Because of me. Because of all the people around the world who have not yet heard the name of Jesus Christ. He is being patient from destroying this wretched, awful place. He is being patient so that many could be saved. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but he wants everyone, every single person, to repent. That is the God we serve. He is a God of mercy, a God of grace, and a God of love and compassion. And that is his heart. His heart is for the people. For the people to turn from their sins, to turn to him as Lord and Savior, The reason that Jesus has not returned is because God wants to save everyone. 
That's why he gave the, the disciples, that's why he gave us that global mission. Start in Jerusalem, spread to Judea, to Samaria. It was an ever-increasing radius to the ends of the earth, constantly spreading the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ to the whole world. It says he is patiently enduring this fallen world. I feel that. I've, I'm patiently enduring this fallen world, to be perfectly honest. He's patiently enduring this fallen world so that many could be saved. But how are they going to be saved? It's through you, through me, through his church. God's chosen tool for saving the world has been and will always be the church. This movement that started in Jerusalem and spread to Judea, Samaria, and throughout the entire world, and we're still pushing the corners of the world. We're still, we still have places to go. That is our global mission. That's our global mission, to spread the good news of Jesus Christ to all people, all nations, all tongues throughout the entire world. And aren't you proud to be a part of that mission? Doesn't it just fill you with joy that God has called us, that God has empowered us to be a part of this global mission? I want you to raise your hands. I know you're all online, but how many of you are proud to be a part of that mission? Good. Now get to work. You raised your hand. I saw it. Get to work. Bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. Bring it. Don't stand around with your hands in your pockets waiting for someone better or waiting for someone more qualified than you to come around. Because I got to tell you, there has never been someone more qualified to reach your circle of people than you. You have every single qualification that you need when you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that lives within you, that is your qualification. You are licensed. You are bonded. You are certified to do God's work. So go and do it. Go and do it. You have the Holy Spirit. So I encourage you, seek out your place in global missions. How does God want to use you in global missions? Is God calling you to be a missionary to your city? to your state, to your country, or to a foreign nation, or all the way, or halfway around the world. God is calling some people in this live stream to be a missionary, and we need to listen to that calling. Or maybe the Lord is calling you to support missionaries financially or prayerfully. Lord knows they need it. They need people who are able to finance their mission. God's kingdom doesn't just work on the people who are running on the front lines. We need support. They need support. That is, and there's no, there's no job that is more important than the other. We are all parts of this kingdom. And we are all workers in God's kingdom, advancing the kingdom of God forward. Whatever it is, seek the Lord and ask him this question. How can I help with global missions? This is the kind of prayer, there are some prayers when you ask God, it's almost guaranteed you're going to get a response. (laughs) One of the questions you can ask is, God, how can I be used? Lord, I submit myself to you. Tell me, what do you want me to do just to help save people? Oh man, guys, he's going to give you pictures. He's going to give you words. He's going to give you a location. He's going to give you an amount, a number. Because you asked, because you said, here I am, Lord, send me. Here I am, Lord, use me. God responds to prayers like that. And I encourage you to pray at that, pray that this week, to pray it today. And When, not if, when he answers you, get to work. Bring the kingdom. You can do it. 
We believe in you as a pastoral team, as a church. We believe in you, and we are here to support you and guide you and equip you as God has equipped you with that Holy Spirit. We're going to empower you to do it. Now, with every, every eye closed, every head bowed, I want to just pray that right now. Jesus, you see our hearts, you see all these people in this room and in the live stream. Lord, I pray that today you would reveal yourself to your people. You would reveal to them how you want them to be used in global missions. Lord, we're asking you to call people into ministry. Call people to be missionaries here or on the other side of the world. Give them a country. Give them a nation. Give them a language to translate the Bible into Jesus. Give them an amount to donate. Give them a prayer to pray. Lord, I pray that you would just cement into the heart of every single person listening their place in your global mission. Speak to them, Jesus, and empower them to do it through their Holy Spirit. We ask things of this of you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Pastor Garen's going to come up on stage, and he's going to continue our talk on global missions and t- talk about NFC's role. Yeah. yeah. Good. Great word, Pastor Christian. Great word. And it's not, just a, it's not just a side word. It's not an auxiliary word. It is a foundational word uh, from, from what Jesus commanded us to do and to be about. So I love it. That was awesome. Because of Jesus' command to be his witnesses in Judea, uh, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth, because Jesus said, go take this message of the gospel, the good news about Jesus, to the whole world. Because of that, we are not standing around with our hands in our pockets at NFC. Definitely not. And it's, it's uh, awesome that we are part of the Assemblies of God. It is a, not only a national movement of, of churches, but really an international, it is a global movement of people following Jesus, uh, filled with the Spirit, and on mission. One of the top reasons that the Assemblies of God was even founded uh, just after uh, the uh, 1900s, so about 1911, 1914, right in that time, was because we wanted, as, as a growing spirit-filled community, we wanted to make sure that we fulfilled Jesus' mission. So world missions is one of the reasons the Assemblies of God even came into being. It's very cool. We, we have a, a really a, an excellent world-class missions um, strategy and system in the Assemblies of God. I'm very proud of it. We, uh, we take people who feel a call to world missions, and we have a system where we, we, uh, we, in a sense, vet them, check them out, make sure that they are fit and equipped and actually called by God. And then we have a system for getting them to the foreign field. They, uh, a typical uh, world missionary with the Assemblies of God goes out on the field for four years, and then they come back for a year to meet with supporting churches and pastors. Uh, and they, they have this rhythm, and when from time to time we get to have a missionary, like today, uh, with us. That's why, because they, they take just a little break to come off the field and, and just give us reports and, and um, partner, continue to partner with the church. It's very cool. Our Assemblies of God World Missionaries, they have to, they are required to raise two kinds of cash budgets. A, a cash, the, uh, cash budget that gets them to the foreign field, gets them like their deposits for their house and stuff like that. But it also helps them to be able to purchase equipment for, for ministry. Then they also have a monthly budget that they are required to raise. And that, that monthly budget, it's the, the um, people like us, like our church and individuals, we, we promise or pledge, we make a faith promise that we will support a given missionary monthly for the next four years, for the, the time that they are out on the field doing their work, doing their ministry. So it's really quite a, it's quite a process, even for an Assemblies of God missionary, just to be able to get out there and go. But when they do, they have all of us supporting them. It's, it's a pretty cool partnership. Uh, 
So the way it, it typically works in Assemblies of God World Missions is that a lot of churches do a little for a lot of missionaries. So the other way that it could be done is, is not the way that we necessarily do it, is where one church, in a sense, promises to, to, to supply the whole monthly budget for a given missionary. We don't do that. All of our churches uh, that, that, uh, that agree to support with just a small amount a month, like $50 a month or $75 a month or $100, $150 a month, something like that for uh, each missionary. So then it's, it's very cool and very strong if a church is not able to, to give as much that missionary doesn't have to come off the field because all of their support didn't come from one church. Their support comes from many churches. So it's a very strong, strategic way to support missionaries. And we're, we're definitely a, a part of it here at, at Northwest Family Church. Uh, those of us, like, like uh, Pastor Shelley and myself, who tithe, we give the first 10% of our income to the Lord and to his work as we believe the Bible uh, requires of us and God requires of us. When we give t the first 10% of our income, we want to do more because there's such a blessing there. There's, there's not only a feeling blessing, but there's just the, the, the joy of participating in the work of God. And so we like to give beyond our tithe, beyond 10%. So Shelly and I, we give uh, to World Missions every single month, all, all, all the years we've been married, so 33 plus years. And, and even before we were married, I gave every single month to World Missions on top of my tithe. Uh, because people do that at our church, NFC is able to support 65 missionaries every single month. And we're not that huge of a church but we're really making a big impact in the world. It's very, very cool. I've got the list of missionaries in front of us, in front of me here. Uh, so, many, so many individual missionaries, but then also several organizations. There are a couple of missionaries that grew up in our church, and we got to meet uh, one of those just a couple of weeks ago, uh, Megan and Lance, uh, that we support every month. And uh, as well, uh, training centers like Northwest University, we, we give a little bit for the training of missionaries every single month. Uh, so we're, we are really making a huge difference uh, around the world. And I love that. I'm proud of that. I'm excited about that. And uh, I, I want to just invite you to be a part. What, what we're doing as a church is our goal is to give 10% of our general income to world missions, to missions beyond just what we're doing right here in our region. We are, our, our primary call is right here. God's put us here, so in, uh, in uh, southeast Puget Sound region, we are reaching those people. That's, that's our big, kind of our big emphasis. But it's so important to reach the world that our goal is 10%. And we've been hitting actually a little bit more than that uh, in, in recent months and years. So very, very cool. So you can choose to give beyond your, uh, your tithe. Once you got up to 10%, if you want to give beyond that to World Emissions, uh, there's a place to do that on our website and uh, on our app as well. So it's a joy today to introduce one of those missionaries I was talking about, Chris Ness. And he is currently a missionary to Sicily in Italy. Uh, but, but prior to that, he has had several stations in Africa. And he grew up as a missionary kid so he, he's just known nothing else but missions, really, all his life. And it's, it's so cool that we've been partnering with him for years and years and years, doing our part to keep him and his family on the field, going and being Jesus' witnesses around the world. So uh, today, we get to hear a little bit from him and just a little bit about uh, wh what's going on in his life and the impact of world missions that he has and that we have as his partner. So uh, you're going to have to clap really loud where you are for Chris Ness to hear, but let's, let's give a nice NFC warm welcome to missionary Chris Ness. Well, thank you, Pastor Garen. And I just, I wanted to just express uh, my gratitude. Uh, I, as I was thinking back to NFC and how long that they've been a part of what we've been doing initially in Africa and now in Sicily, I got to thinking it was, I think, in 1998 when you first started uh, month supporting us monthly. And so I just want to say thank you and God bless you. Through your partnership and through the partnership of many other individuals and churches, we're able to do what God has called us to do. And as Pastor Garen mentioned, uh, Africa, I grew up there and we served in three different countries in Africa. And at one point, missions leadership asked us, would you consider 
um, serving the marginalized of Europe, serving those refugees and immigrants that come into Europe. And so that's what we've been doing for these last two and a half years in the nation of Italy on the island of Sicily. And our vision is to demonstrate welcoming love to those who have it least and need it most in the name of Jesus. Um, Sicily, the Italian island that Heidi and I serve and live on, um, it, it is one of the main gateways for uh, Africans who are leaving oppressive governments, who are leaving civil war, who are leaving uh, countries where there's religious persecution, they're fleeing and they're, they're taking these cross Mediterranean trips on boats that are, are oftentimes triple capacity of what they should be. And they're taking this dangerous trip and arriving on the shores of Sicily. And each year, thousands of men, women, and children make this crossing, sometimes at their own peril, but many making it. And people who are statistics on the news and in articles, they, to us, have become individuals who are made in the image of God and in, in need of, of a Savior. And Heidi and I, we get to meet them. We get to rub shoulders with them. We get to hear their stories and, and hear uh, their trauma, but we also get to be a part of what God is doing in their lives. Uh, in fact, two days after we arrived in Sicily in, in 2019, we met Binti, uh, an African woman who had left her country because of an oppressive government. And uh, she ended up in Sicily, grew, grew up a Muslim, and she came to, to Europe to find a better life, and she found Jesus. You see, there was this group of missionaries who had opened a, uh, they opened a drop-in center in the town near the refugee settlement that her and her young daughter, um, Ellie, lived in. And, and through, um, through some patience, through just some love, and, and just sharing the gospel, been to now as a follower of Jesus through these missionaries who, who invested in her and Ellie's life. And so we met her uh, two days after we got there at her baptism. We went our separate ways as we went to one part of the island to do language study, and Binti and Ellie uh, ended up having to leave that area because the government closed that settlement down. And nine months later, we end up in the same city. And Thursdays became the highlight of Heidi's and my week because we would have Binti and Ellie over to our apartment for, for life and discipleship. And what a joy it was to, to see Binti grow in Jesus. And what a joy it was to have a toddler in our home. All of our three kids are grown, and now we get Ella to come into um, our home weekly. And, and uh, it was so cool to watch Binti grow in a relationship with Jesus. In fact, one day she, she proclaimed, I am no longer a refugee, I am now a missionary. And that's, what is, that's what's in her mind and her heart as she's grown in the Lord. And as she's grown in the Lord and as she grew in our, her trust in us, we also found out that her and Ellie were living in a volatile situation. And by God's grace and through local authorities, they were able to be rescued out of that situation. For a time, they lived when, with us while authorities were looking for, um, for a safe house for them to be in, and eventually they ended up there, and we were not able to know where that was, but we were able to communicate with them by phone. And finally, about a week and a half ago, three days before we left Sicily, we were allowed to travel and meet them in a coffee shop to hear what God is doing in their life, to hear how Binti now has been given a job where um, that she is passionate about. She loves sewing. She's a seamstress, and, and God has provided for that. In fact, it's a paying job that she has now, and just hearing her testimony of how God uh, just has sustained her, how he's been her rock, and then to hear how Ellie, now three, is going to preschool, boy, what a joy it was to hear their testimony. And you know, that's what partnership with missionaries like us uh, from churches like NFC and other churches, that's what it translates into is lives transformed by Jesus. Another thing that um, partnership represents are lives that have yet to be transformed by Jesus. And 
um, it was about a month and a half ago, I began to see this unkempt African man as I would go out in our city of Messina. And finally, about a month ago, I had the opportunity to meet Suleiman in person when I, I saw him at the tram station near our home. And I sat down and I began to talk to him. And I began to hear his story. And his story uh, is that he came to Italy, to Sicily, with hopes for a better life, but he's end up, ended up on the street, homeless. And so as he was, after he told me some of his story, I just, I, I, I wanted to tell him of God's love, and I began to try to tell him how much God loved him and, and began to try to share hope with him. And at one point during that time, he aloofly got up and walked away and eventually came back and and when he came back and as I was talking to him though his English is good he just began to talk in his mother tongue and I remember just grappling with what do I do what do I say how can I share Jesus with Suleiman the tram came and we went our separate ways him still hopeless me honestly discouraged and at a loss of what to do. It was two days later when my wife and I were about, out and about uh, buying fruit and vegetables at our, lo at our local stand that we go to. I looked back and I saw Suleiman. And what I thought, because he comes from the Muslim country of Gambia, is true. He, w he was a Muslim. I saw him there kneeling on a cardboard, a piece of cardboard, not a prayer mat, doing his Friday prayers. And, and that's what partnership also represents. It represents the Suleimans that have yet to be reached. And our dream, when we go back to Sicily, is to open up a drop-in center. Not that places save people, but we want to, uh, we want to have somewhere where we can offer uh, practical helps to people who maybe would not step foot in a church, but they would step foot in a drop-in center. That's, that's our goal. The goal is to see people come to faith in Jesus, for them to be discipled. And so whether it be the, the Suleimans from Gambia, or the Sidibes from Ivory Coast, or the Marikes from Mali, or the Mohammeds from Sudan, or, or, the, um, or others from whatever part in Africa, we want to share God's love for them. And you're partnering with us in that. And you have... And I just want to say thank you for that, and God bless you. Thank you, Chris. And it is awesome to be a partner. Thank you for thinking of us as, as your partner, and we think of you the same way. Uh, when you get back to church next week, hopefully, uh, I want you to know that there is a stack of prayer cards that Chris left for us in the lobby. So you can take one of these, and it just kind of, it just reminds you to pray for our specific missionaries. That's awesome. I love it. So we want to give you an opportunity to, beyond your tithe, give a special missions offering. Even if it's small, if it's big, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, Pastor Shelley and I have already given. And uh, if you go to any of our online ways of giving, you'll notice that there's a step that says what fund or what category do you want to give to? And so you would just choose the one that is labeled Sunday Missionary Guest. So you don't have to remember his name or anything like that, uh, but that'll be, that little option will be live for, uh, for the next week. Uh, so I, I encourage you to do that. If you would do that, would you do it now so you don't forget? And let's just give him and his ministry, Chris and Heidi, a, a, a very big blessing from NFC to help them to be able to get back to the field and have the finances that they need to do that. Awesome. Well, I, I don't want to go away from this service today without giving you one more invitation. And that is, I want to invite you to put your faith in Jesus. If you've, if you've never done that before, or, or if you have wandered away from God, then this is your opportunity and your invitation. I am inviting you to come and put your faith in Jesus today. Why would you do that? Because we're all sinners in need of a Savior. We were born into sin. We need Jesus to save us. And so he offered his life as a sacrifice for us on the cross, paying for your sin and for my sin. And so we want to just invite you to, to pray a prayer right now 
and put your faith in Jesus. Become his apprentice. Not just someone who thinks about Jesus, but someone who follows him and works alongside him and learns from him. Would you just bow your heads with me right now, right where you're at? Uh, you might be watching in your car or at home or watching live or watching later. It doesn't matter. Wherever you are, I invite you to pray right now. And, and just maybe ask the person, if you're with somebody, ask the person on either side of you, do you want to pray this prayer? And uh, let, let's put your faith in Jesus. Uh, I'll just coach you in a prayer uh, as we do that together. Would you pray after me? Jesus, I didn't hear you pray out loud. Jesus, I invite you into my life. Please forgive me of my sins and make me new. I choose to follow you into your mission as your apprentice, starting now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And if you prayed that prayer, I really want to know. I want to be able to encourage you. Uh, and so we have a very easy way to, to just follow up. Would you take out your cell phone right now so you don't forget and text the word RESTART, which means like you're restarting your life, restarting your faith. Text the word RESTART to the phone number 97000. And then uh, just obey those prompts. Give us enough contact info that we can just give you some next steps in your faith. It, uh, you've just begun, so don't stop there. Keep going. It's very important. Awesome. Well, as we, as we wrap things up today, uh, there's just a couple of things I wanted to mention. First of all, congratulations to our son, Stephen, and his wife, Taylor, on the birth of little Kaya Estelle. Uh, and we're, we're just so happy to meet her, and uh, we're happy for Stephen and Taylor. Um, if you are, um, I, I know you're watching online, so you're watching online. Would you like or subscribe our YouTube channel just so more people can hear about Jesus? Next Sunday, our plan is to be back in person. We, our live stream will continue, but next Sunday we'll be back together. We've had the carpets freshly cleaned. All the chairs are set up. We're ready to go and excited to see you. Uh, just one little practical thing. If you're sick, please stay home. If you're sick, please stay home. And I'm serious about that. Uh, for sure, if you've got a temp or other, other symptoms of COVID, uh, or if you're not even sure what you got, but you know you're sick, please stay home. We just want to make sure we're keeping everybody healthy. God bless you, and we'll see you next Sunday. God bless.